Intel breaking ground at its newest manufacturing plant in Ohio earlier. President Biden was on site to celebrate the chipmaker's $20 billion investment into the Buckeye state. And as we saw during the pandemic, when factories that make these ships shut down, chips shut down, the global economy comes to a halt, driving up costs for families and everyone, not just here, but around the world. In fact, one-third of the core inflation last year was due to higher prices of automobiles because of the shortage of the semiconductors needed to build those automobiles. Folks, we need to make these chips right here in America to bring down everyday costs and create good jobs. Joining us now for more on this, we want to bring in Jared Bernstein, member of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Jared, it's great to have you back here on Yahoo Finance. Obviously, a huge win for the Biden administration, obviously a direct result of the CHIPS Act that was passed. Just talk to us about the significance of this and when you expect to see a direct uh, impact on the U.S. economy. You're already seeing a direct impact because you have something here that we've wanted to see for a very long time, not just public support of a critical uh, issue, standing up a domestic, uh, a domestic semiconductor uh, industry, so important. You heard the president talking about autos, but so important for pretty much everything you could think of, including the venue that you and I are talking right now uh, over, uh, but not the least of which also, though, is national security. But not just public support, private support. You've got literally tens of billions, hundreds of billions flowing in from the private sector, capital, private capital that's crowded in uh, by uh, support like the CHIPS Act, signaling that the U.S. government is in the business of creating incentives, whether it's supporting manufacturing, whether it's a, a tax credit for investment in the kind of materials you need to build a semiconductor fabrication plant, um, bring good jobs, union jobs to these communities, which are, by the way, in states across the land. So as we talk, those investments are literally going into play into the nation's investment bloodstream, and we're very happy to see it. Good to see you, Jared. Uh, it's Friday. I'm quiet quitting, so I'm going to let someone else ask my question. Uh, <laughs> Senator Bernie Sanders, he said this, should American taxpayers provide the microchip industry with a blank check of over $76 billion at a time when semiconductor companies are making tens of billions of dollars in profits and paying their execs exorbitant compensation packages? And the far right, ironically, is aligned with Mr. Sanders on this. What's your answer? Well, first of all, remember, this was a bipartisan bill, so uh, definitely uh, had support from, from all sides. Um, I'm always going to respect whatever Bernie Sanders is talking about and give him his due. Uh, I think in this case, you really have to look at some of the guardrails that go into this bill, uh, especially if, by the way, if you connect this with some other recent legislation like the Inflation Reduction Act, we're talking about domestic production, okay? This is not a bill that uh, allows you to invest in uh, American taxpayer dollars in China or Malaysia or overseas, where uh, at this point we get so many of our chips from. Another response to that critique is that we used to produce something like between 30 and 40 percent of the chips we use. Now it's down to around 10 percent. That's just unsustainable. And we saw the frailty, the non-resilience of that supply chain uh, during the pandemic. And that was crystal clear uh, to President Biden that we had to do something about that. Onshoring domestic supply chain is something that uh, uh, an insightful uh, economic thinker like Bernie Sanders uh, has long supported. So I think that uh, that there is a uh, very much the kinds of guardrails that his comments suggest we should have. They're in there. And Jared, I also want to take a look at the Biden-Harris economic blueprint there coming out this morning. One of the things listed, empowering workers, perhaps filling some of these skills gaps as well, ma making and building in America, giving families breathing room. As you look at some of these in this blueprint, how far are we away from seeing these things come to fruition? Well, many of them are coming to fruition. And I think the nice thing about the blueprint is that in its 58 pages, uh, it uh, covers not only where we want to go, the kind of architecture that Biden-Harris envisioned uh, since they uh, were campaigning, but where we've been, where we've gotten. And if you look at uh, every one of those five areas, empowering workers, building it in America, and so on, um, uh, you see that uh, th those accomplishments are in the field already. Uh, we've actually had some real success 
in uh, union membership. I'm sure you've reported on it in areas like Starbucks and Amazon. And, 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 and those kinds of measures have a lot to do with a National Labor Relations Board that's finally working for workers again. Talk about making it in America. Well, we've just been talking about uh, uh, Intel breaking ground at a plant near Columbus, Ohio, and there's plants going up in Idaho and Arizona and New York State, and North Carolina. In all those cases, we're talking about uh, build it here in America. And with every one of those, I could tick down where we are. But look, the thing about the blueprints is it's also about where we're going. And we have work to do. We have work to do in our housing agenda. We have work to do in our child and elder care agenda. Uh, we've added real progressivity to the tax code, but we'd like to do more there. So that's in there as well. The thing about a blueprint is it's about something, to your point, that you're going to build. Almost everything in here is more of a snapshot, isn't it? No new real policy proposals. Well, I think what we're, what, what we're trying to do here is look back on um, all that uh, we've accomplished so far. I, I will tell you this, and I, I think you would probably agree with me. I was played a role in many of the policies that are in there, and I couldn't remember all of them. So I guarantee you, if you read through this blueprint, you're going to learn a lot about things we've done that are new policies to you because either like me, you forgot about them or you never knew about them in the first place. <laughs> for example, um, did you know that we raised the minimum wage for federal workers to $15 an hour? Uh, that's an accomplishment that's on the books. That's in the field. It's helping low wage workers under federal contracts as we speak. You know, we talked about our housing agenda. There are things in the bipartisan infrastructure law that nobody knows about that push back on exclusionary zoning, which is really one of the, the worst things uh, uh, out there if you're trying to uh, build affordable, accessible housing. But under the BIL, under the infrastructure law, you can get uh, points on your bid if you're building in areas of density and transportation hubs. That's in there too. So there's so much in there that people don't know about, along with policies, as I just mentioned, that are absolutely critical to the economy supply side, growing our labor supply, like child care, elder care, immigration reform. Uh, so uh, take a look. Jared, there certainly are a lot of Jared, uh, administrative wins, and it's no surprise there. How do you translate, though, that into, into voter appreciation or gains really here in the midterms? Because when you still look at a lot of these polls, Biden's approval rating is just over 40%. Well, that's probably a better question for someone who's not an economist. <laughs> uh, but um, I, I can tell you that uh, the, uh, the blueprint is, and my conversation with you today, and we've had many since, and I, I've talked to, uh, I don't know, probably 30 people in the last couple of days about this blueprint, is very much about information sharing, trying to ha help people understand uh, the progress that we've made. And if you want to talk politics, something the president always says don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. And I think the key there is to look about um, what uh, uh, kinds of accomplishments that we've uh, made and how important it is for uh, an administration uh, with these kinds of priorities to uh, continue to be able to implement them uh, versus what the other side is bringing to the table in these policy areas, which as far as I can see is pretty much tearing down everything we're trying to build up here. And Jared, you mentioned a lot of things in that economic blueprint that people perhaps aren't aware of. When you're this close to the midterm elections, what do you think is going to make this really break through some of this, break through some of this noise so that people actually do see what the, the um, administration has accomplished? I would say it's conversations exactly like this one. Uh, look, there's, I don't think this is rocket science. Uh, you got to get out there and you got to explain things to people. You have to hopefully do it in ways that resonate with them. And uh, you can tell me whether I've accomplished that in the last five minutes, but it's certainly <laughs> our goal. And uh, that's, uh, that's the only way I know how to do things. And that's uh, straight ahead, Joe Biden, pragmatic, uh, do stuff to help the middle class and try to explain it to them. I don't think it's that complicated. All right, Jared Bernstein from the White House, thanks for coming here on Yahoo Finance. Appreciate you. Sure, enjoy the weekend. You too.